uh, a very good afternoon to everyone and uh, on behalf of vapors uh, we are actually now presenting probably about uh, eight years nine years in a row nine years in a row and uh, we started our journey from the agra AIOS conference come a long way uh, this is a pure video assisted uh, problem oriented vitreoretinal retinal surgery core that we intended to provide both basic middle and advanced levels depending on the case that we are trying to present and depending upon the message that we want to give across in today's video topics we are covering retinal detachment, diabetic fractional retinal detachments, GRTs, and an unusual uh, one hippal endows tumor surgery. Uh, the pattern that we are following this time is very different from what we used to do earlier. Earlier we used to have it one to two minutes of a video followed by discussions on that for about six to eight minutes. Uh, this we were doing it for the last seven eight years but this year uh, we tweaked it a little uh, we are going to have the video running for almost about uh, 15 minutes uh, it is partially edited and the idea is to learn each aspect of the thing as we go by and uh, so each of us will be having about 20 minutes both video and discussions running simultaneously so i think uh, let me start the thing with uh, an introduction of today's uh, presenters would be dr ruchir tiwari uh, rp center alumni presently practicing retina in uh, Ghaziabad. He has his own center. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Reddy, I am sure his uh, reputation precedes him, so I don't need to say much. Then I have Dr. Puneet Gupta, again a retina specialist from Ghaziabad. He and I, we have been together into planning this whole thing right from the beginning along with Amit Khosla and some more people like Dr. Pramod Ginde and uh, we have Sanjeev Hansraj and some who are not available in today's thing. Then, uh, of course, we have Dr. Pramod Ginde. All of us are aware of him and his credentials. Arka Prabha Pradhan, he's the new kid in town. And uh, what little that I gathered about him Pramod has a high regard for his work, so we are looking forward to you, Arka. And finally, it's me, Dr. S.T. Murlidhar. So now let me start the thing. Over to you, Ruchir. Uh, so I'll be presenting a short video of uh, retinal detachment surgery. Now this. So I'll be talking, I'll be presenting a small video. So as uh, Dr. Murlidhar has already uh, spoken about the, the method of doing this today is that we run videos and simultaneously about each step of the surgery or if, the, or if there is any question, then that can be put up simultaneously. So a uh, short clinical history of the patient. This is a 60 year old gentleman who presented with a sudden loss of vision in his left eye, one day duration. So this is one of those classic uh, cases of uh, flashes of light followed by floaters and then a, s uh, then a curtain like vision loss, uh, the book description of, of a retinal detachment that the patient had uh, come with. BC waivers finger counting in the left eye, slit lamp examination had nucleus process grade one, retrolental pigments or sharper sign was seen. The fundus showed a superior retinal detachment, a superior lattice uh, related HST. 
macula was off and patient had a PVR grade A. So plan was to do a 25 gauge uh, MIVS with ILM peeling, endo laser and sulfur tamponade. So with this we move on to the surgery part. So this is the first step of the surgery to make uh, the entries into the vitreous cavity. So I'm using valved uh, trocar cannula 25 gauge. Biplanar entry is made. So there's a small amount of cataract, but it was assessed before the surgery that the cataract was not going to hamper with the surgery. So cataract surgery before via surgery was not planned. Uh, Dr. Richard, uh, I have a question for the, for the panel. A uh, lot of people are using 27 gauge uh, uh, also for vitreoretinal surgery for last five, seven years. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, doctor, uh, it's a question from the panel. Uh, what are the issues with 27? Uh, what, how, what, what are the advantages and disadvantages if you are using 27 gauge surgery in these scenarios of retinal detachment? So First, advantages yeah. and what are the disadvantages? I think one of the most, uh, um, one of, yeah. So one of, uh, yeah. So I think one of the uh, advantages of 27 gauge is uh, that the port sealing is very good. There's hardly any case where after the surgery we've need we've uh, felt a need to suture the the uh, the port in any of our cases. And 27 gauge uh, for vit for uh, retinal detachment per se. Otherwise, I don't think it offers much more advantage over 25 gauge. For diabetics, it's a different situation. Uh, but in few cases where I've done 27 gauge, that is the only advantage I could think of that the post sealing is very good, and uh, nothing more for a retinal detachment per se, sir. I mean, Dr. Pramod sir could. Uh, Partly, I agree with you, and uh, I mean both probably would be equally good. Particularly when you're looking at the case, not much manipulation you are going to do, and gas if it is in injecting, which is unlikely to because being a superior break, uh, that's good enough. So, but uh, somehow I always feel when you are adding silicon oil, I always prefer to suture the sclerotomy I mean because there's always a risk of some leakage somewhere in subconjunctival. Uh, you have a silicon oil granulomas or you see the bubbles isolated. So whenever I uh, want to use a silicon oil, irrespective of gauge, I would like to suture. And if I'm suturing, obviously, you know, uh, might as well in 25 or 23, doesn't make difference, which probably obviously with 25, I will finish much faster. I'll go ahead with 25 in that sense, if I'm planning oil injection. How do you modify your settings compared to 23 and 25 for main, ish, ma main uh, steps like PVD inductions or Core vitrectomy, any, any any modification you do? So for core vitrectomy 23, I think vacuum settings are much lower. They're around 300 to 350. With 25 gauge and a 10,000 cutter uh, cut rate, it's around 550 to 600. And with 27, I think we have to keep maximum 650 vacuum settings. PVD induction is more or less similar. Intraocular pressure is uh, controlled by the machine now. So uh, keeping a higher bottle height doesn't help much. Uh, other than that, I'd, uh, in shave mode, obviously, uh, 23 would require uh, more use of a shave mode. 25, again, 25 and 27, shave mode per se is not required, specifically with 10,000 uh, cut rate cutters. So it does become faster with 23 gauge, but that safety wala issue, I think with 25 gauge, it is much safer when we are doing peripheral shaving. And same with 27. One thing, sir, I wanted to say was that with 27 gauge, at least the Alcon machine doesn't have a oil injection system still. So for that, we have to change the port to a, to a 25 gauge port, then use the, use the cannula supplied by them to inject oil. And even for SOR, I don't think that small gauge is good enough to put in or take out oil. Eva has a uh, 27 gauge injector also. Yeah. And also to add on, uh, because when it comes to 10,000 and then now twin blade system, be well probed because port is almost always open. Yeah. And when port is open, that concept of sort of shaving, shaving is, is gone open. now. And uh, and being port is always open, so suction is much much more than uh, what 
we initially used to have. So now you have to slow p- bring down your Spring. construction savings yes. somewhere around 200, 300, not again 500 or 600, particularly when you're using Shiva. fuel led. Otherwise, uh, yeah, otherwise 400, somewhere around 25 and maybe 500 to 550 I use for self. Uh, but still somehow 27 is not still available everywhere. They have some in-between problem with the manufacturing issues and other things. But I think now it's uh, coming up uh, quickly yeah. everywhere. Uh, can you switch off the lights of this? Not possible. Yeah. So as we continue with the, sur- with the surgery, mm-hmm. uh, core vitrectomy is first being done. Then traction around the brake is being relieved and vitrectomy is being completed. So again, as... Uh, Sorry, uh, just can you hold on? Yeah. Uh, I just have a question here. Why not to do scleral buckle? Why vitrectomy? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was about to ask. Yeah? That's what I was about to ask, you know, with the thing with break, which is there, yeah. and buckle. Uh, why go inside? I think all three modalities would have been good in this particular case. The pneumatic, because there's a single superior break. No, a pneumatic probably I would say no, because there's a lattice, you have vitreous uh, attachment, and then yeah. tear is spoiled. Uh, you can make out a extraneous yeah. attraction is there. That's why. Uh, so probably buckle or vitrectomy. So any specific reason why you chose to do uh, uh, buckle here, Dr. Puneet, you can have <laughs> your comments add on. Would have been an option. I think, uh, this is one case where you can uh, do <laughs> either one. 60-year-old patient, very high chances of cataract formation in the next few years. And uh, MIVS per se is, the conjunctiva is not touched at all. It's minimally invasive. Yeah. It's more, uh, it's easier for the patient also. Patient patient comfort is much more. And I'm comfortable doing both. So, and the results are similar in both. Yeah, but also uh, being a 60-year-old, progression of cataract in next three to six months will be much, much True. faster True. compared True. to... Yes. True. Rather than being with it. Yeah. But patient comfort and everything becomes much more with uh, b- uh, with MIVS. Probably the results are also the same. Two, three things. I think anesthesia is one component that you yeah. would like to be a little aware of. And the I second thing is also th- when you are actually opening Muscle. extensively. Yeah. So that makes post op recovery yeah. that much more uh, turbulent. Yeah. I think. <laughs> I think it's surgeon's preference now. Sir. Uh, uh, for a young patient, uh, buckling I would have been the I thing. See, this is a superior break. And suppose you have a break which is sitting just underneath your entry. Right. Would you want to modify from the beginning itself? The yeah, entry yeah, definitely, point? definitely. Then the port site would be different. Yeah. So, for example, I more, I more or less try to make it uh, more or less near 3 or 9. And if I know that the break is at, say, 10 o'clock, yeah. Then I can m- uh, maybe move it a little more superior or more temporal so that the port uh, is actually away from the break and vitrectomy and both doing laser becomes easier later on during the surgery. Okay. You can go forward. Uh, just uh, anybody in the audience would like to stop in between, please feel free to stop us and ask. We are trying to do a little bit modified version of live surgery, very minimal editing. But it's more we are running like as if you are looking watching at the live study. So anybody would like to stop any doubt question, please feel free to ask or stop us any moment, anywhere we'll stop. It's not like that wait till end and then ask question. Yeah, you can continue. I yeah. Think. So peripheral vitrectomy is now being done. Uh, what additional precaution you take while doing vitrectomy <laughs> here because part of retina is mobile is a partial detachment and part yeah. of retina is attached. Uh, where you would like to initiate your vitrectomy? Sir, uh, generally what I do in such cases is, and if specifically it's a bullet surgery, I, yeah. yeah. I would generally start vitrectomy near the break itself. Okay. So that I can do fluid fluid exchange and the retina and the retina settles down quite a bit. So by doing this and by doing this maybe two, three times during the surgery, and if it's specifically a single break, then the fluid fluid entry is not also that much. So I may be able to avoid the use of PFCL in such cases just by doing fluid fluid exchange and then uh, doing vitrectomy first near port near the break and then core vitrectomy. Yeah, no, partly why I ask this question because uh, if a total detachment is a different thing, partial detachment is a different thing because as you keep on doing because to reach your break also and so break now if you're right near the sclerotomy what previous question was there then you initiate there but to reach other area 
probably you have to negotiate to the vitreous, so you mm. are going to cut some vitreous. And while cutting a vitreous and you are having a mobile retina, retina starts fluttering. Yeah. That some, uh, some amount of tug, height of the R RD start increasing. increasing yeah. So I would prefer always finish your vitrectomy where In retina is attached. attached. So you finish that area and then slowly come on other area where retina is detached. So before, otherwise what happen where you start, retina start fluttering, which detached retina, attached retina also by the time you reach there will be detached. detached. So you have a counter resistant, retina is attached already and when you pick, remove the vitreous there, so safety margin basically, eventually you are going to remove, eventually the yeah. end will be same, but safety margin is much better, the risk of atrogenic complication is much less. So remove the vitreous where retina is attached and then slowly come on either side towards the detached retina. Okay, and again um, here because you have harshut here, you assume that um, PVD, PVD is there yeah. already. So then why I, I agree, step is right. Why I want to use again try try time scale on here? Vitroschisis. Lot of my patients have seen vitroschisis. Exactly there have yeah. been cases where. So in this particular case also, I did see the PVD when I started doing vitrectomy, but the case will will uh, be successful or it will fail depending upon whether PVD was there or not. Similar question also arises, what, what, do you, what, what we can do, it's a question from the panel, not <laughs> yeah. what else we can do to prevent uh, incarceration and fluttering the peripheral retina? Maybe. I mean, do, you, we, do you use uh, LPFC uh, uh, for settling down and doing the biomanual uh, uh, depression? Yeah, my Raju can take the question. No, no, I agree with uh, Dr. B.B. that uh, I would definitely would like to start with the attached retina because that would prevent the retina from detaching more and making it more difficult. And especially the breaks like big ones like this, it's easier. Even if you remove fluid from subretinal space, it easily goes inside. If it's a smaller breaks, the possibility of retina staying back are higher. So I would not want to remove uh, subretinal fluid. It actually makes it easier for the fluid to go in inside if you remove the subretinal fluid, because that is thicker fluid, thicker and yes, not easy for them to go in. Yes, and if you remove it and then it becomes easier. So you, the moment you keep start doing it, it keeps going in faster. Actually, if it is uh, closer to the infusion cannula, that itself will, the flow itself will push the retina to detach yeah. further. So I would not do that that way. And I would, uh, if it is uh, becoming too bullish and too mobile, I would, prefer to put a PFCL yeah. to support the posterior retina and then do it. There's nothing wrong in doing it. Just to add one more, see previously, we used to be very, very conservative with PFCL. The reason is not only cost, availability as well. Okay, so whatever is there, you have to be just use very judiciously because even if you are willing to pay, patient is willing to pay, you won't get that easily. True. But now it is freely available and it is not that expensive also. So actually, that I mean, not every case, but do not hesitate if you need to, because that definitely enhances your safety margin. Because retina holding it back, yeah. atrogenic complication will definitely minimize. You don't have to use PFCL to settle their whole retina. Yeah. You just use just enough PFCL to just keep the retina stable. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, limited PFCL we can use in the posterior pole to stabilize the retina. And one another thing is uh, during PVD induction in case of subtotal retinal detachment, we can uh, start from the attached retina that uh, PVD induction also will be a little easier when you start from the attached retina. One more, one more way of doing things is if suppose you could remove some amount of vitreous, you can start doing vitrectomy using an air and start attaching the retina. So you might still be able to do sometimes. If you don't have an option of PFCL not available, now what to do? So you can still do something like that, but not that common. <laughs> right. So the take-home message would be, should you use the PFCL in almost all cases and say play or take chances and then go ahead? Judicious uh, use is yeah. obviously necessary because whatever said and done, it cost goes high definitely. Yeah, plus so complications. Compli yeah. So basically, uh, you have a balance approach, case to case. I won't say blanket yes or no. So case to case, you decide, and uh, keep that cost factor also in mind and safety factor also in mind. Okay, and have uh, 
mean, uh, that is what probably you are going to do each case. Do you think there are any other factors that are local than these uh, issues of safety and uh, cost on which you decide that PHCL has to be put? Well, that I think probably yeah. come a little bit later because when you look at a stiffness of retina, we are planning to yeah. peel the membrane while using uh, in a mobile in a mobile retina. Want to assess whether retina is uh, free enough or having some uh, premature membranes which are not able to see, but retina appears stiff. Those are other indication. Probably as we move forward, we'll just take okay. on that. So I'll skip this step a little bit. So, no, so just one yeah. minute now. Uh, what you see here, that uh, tricot, anything specific you think is totally, uh, I mean, vitreous, uh, there's no vitreous at all? Or vitreous is there? Uh, there because is something it lo looks like that as if your tricot is sitting there, yeah. not freely uh, coming out. Does it indicate anything? In some cases, vitreous fusis, in some cases, vitreous fusis and that happens. So posterior pole, uh, so some in some cases only macula will have a thin sheet of vitreous attached. So uh, tricot will stick to that particular area and it will not be uh, and it will not be seen anywhere else. So like nasal side, there was no tricot attached, but the macular region tricot was still there. Yeah, fast and sliding is moving yeah. fast. Yeah. 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 Also, sometimes yes, vitreous kyphosis you want to roll out, but Why also what I wanted to hear is like if you if you put a put too much of tricot. It will still it itself sits there down. stick and then you will have a thick layer of tricot. It comes sometime removal become difficult. It looks as a thick sheet and then sometimes you lose your uh, depth perception because you don't know at what level your retina is and whole thing say like a blob like thing sitting there. So we need a tricot just as a just to sprinkle it. So, the so ideally how much would you like to sprinkle? Was it diluted? And if dilutions, what is the dilution you prefer? Generally, I use undiluted, um, a little bit, one, a few drops actually, just to uh, cover the disc area from where the PVD induction has to happen. Not too much of tricot, but uh, I may use it under, I, I, I do use sometimes diluted uh, tricot just at the end of the surgery to check for any peripheral vitreous if it is there. Otherwise, uh, for PVD induction, yeah. You need to go back, I think. Hmm. So fundamentally, the use of tricot is only to look for the vitreous configurations and residual composition. More so for peripheral if you are actually wanting. So in case you have done a peripheral thorough dissection, then probably you can avoid giving a Two four two two. Yeah. Yeah. Can continue. Left hemorrhage. Yeah. What's that hemorrhage okay. that we are seeing there? So that uh, that was from the beginning of the surgery. The patient had uh, vitreous hemorrhage also. So just near the break there's a small blood vessel that is running and encompassing the break and one blood vessel had broken off. So this is the peeling step while I'm peeling being done. So I would generally initiate from the na uh, nasal side towards the temporal side because that gives a little traction and uh, peeling without PHCL that makes things a little easier. So what is the extent of uh, island peeling? What is the extent of ILM? Do you peel in all cases? I do, sir. You do? All retinal attachment cases. What advantage so do you see? Uh, again, uh, sir, right. I think one, or one thing is that I'm 100% sure that the vitreous is gone. That's a very, Mean. that may be a very crude way of putting it, but the only sure shot way of saying that there is no vitreous species anymore is that if the ILM is gone. Second thing is in my cases, I've seen a lot of cases where there is ERM formation la uh, later on. So these cases are five years back, which I operated. So there are two things, two points towards it. One is that whether ERM will happen. Second is the more important question is whether that ERM will lead to vision loss. So ERM formation does happen in around 20, 10 to 20% cases, but vision loss is very less. Normally it is said that uh, if you have uh, missed a break in the periphery small, and then if you have actually left it like that, sometimes in the next 
probably a few years we can start having the ERM formulation a little bit more clear. So probably one message is that if you are suspecting that an ERM might be forming, so in the post operative. Yes. So you need to be very careful on the periphery. That's not it. I think Rajiv yesterday mentioned. No, I would not uh, do an ER ILM peeling for all cases, but uh, if I see any amount of TVR changes, in the, those cases I would prefer to do it because there is already a process which has started. And the chances of having an ERM post-operatively is quite high in those cases. So not in a fresh retinal detachment where you don't have much of a chance of TVR. I think uh, we need to understand each step in a surgery has its own set of complications. True. And ERM peeling is not again enough here. You have a few more blillers you can see uh, there now as you start peeling. And again, in a detached retina, Filling ILM is again is uh, much more traumatic, much more difficult also technically because there is no counter ray itself. So what I totally agree with Rajiv that if you think clean post ray fold, there is no puckering anywhere. The retina is uh, reasonably mobile. Probably I also own seen. And particularly case like this you are talking about, and you have more or less ensure PVD is there. And in fact, even if you little bit suppose like isolated island of or kyphis, uh, I mean, you leave behind, which is not having a traction or tug or um, not preventing your break to be flattened down, probably I will not peel that one. The incidence is uh, peel or without peel, incidence is somewhere around 6 to 8 percent, not 20 percent. So with for 8 percent cases, 92 percent cases, I do not want to peel ILM just to risking them for that case. Uh, my point, sir, only one point that is there. If if I'm putting gas, I don't have the option of going back in again. No, so that's there now. What I mean is, like, no, no, no that's <laughs> nice. But there's nothing wrong feeling because, yeah. again, what I'm trying to tell you is it's surgeon's discretion. Yeah, maybe uh, not yeah, in the every way case. And what happened with our experience, with if you land up in a few cases, something like this, and then you say, oh, I would have feel, I would have, it would have been better. It yeah. happens once in a while. But each case is different, as we say. True. So, but what I would say, tell, put it as a, I won't blanketly go for each case. Again, I would say always as a VR surgeon, keep open mind and always do, looking at that particular theory, we all know. Theoretically, we talk, we should do or should not do and percentages we talk, but when always I say, when it come to individual case, it is all or none. Okay, True. so always, always it is like, so I would have a decision making is for that particular case, not the as probability. A general, yeah. True. True. I think, uh, We'll hurry this, yeah, yeah. then we'll go ahead. So I'll come to the last. Uh, so indentation vitrectomy was done, and in the end, uh, what do you do with that uh, blood vessel which is running across the blood break? Because oh yeah. there is a risk of uh, subsequently can you can just give way and have another episode of. Uh, Sir, I did a, I did a little uh, uh, cauterization at the vessel base where it was going to where it was attaching yeah. at the at the posterior margin. Little and, uh, cautery with my. With my uh, end of uh, yeah. yeah, no, but what happened even if you little cotton, if the stretching is there, vessel somewhere it tear. might tear. Yeah. Uh, that's the reason, best way I would prefer to cut it. Cut it, yeah. Cauterize nicely, both the ends and then both cut the ends, yeah. sni uh, snip it off. Or heavy cautery that itself se 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 separates off. Yeah. True, yeah, I'd prefer to cut it off rather than leaving it there because I had a, a few cases where we just left it and then had a repeat bleeding, though the retina is attached. Everything is there, but the repeat bleeding. So you had to go inside to cut it off, let ultimately. So it yeah. doesn't make sense in leaving it there. It's not going to help anyway. The most of the retinal uh, fibers are cut there. Yeah, yeah. The only thing which I do is if I cut off a uh, blood vessel there, I usually do a little more laser beyond that, so that to prevent any ischemic area beyond. Okay. Okay, we'll skip to the laser part. Now, this case having a nice single isolated break and hot shift here. Uh, is there any role for 360 degree laser or you do just only laser for 
around the break they only did around the break no 360 degree yeah. I think if you have examined your periphery well, and you have removed the peripheral vitreous adequately, there I don't think you need to do a 360 laser in all in the case, cases. Definitely, it's more it's more an overkill. And but uh, there are a couple of surgeons who very, you know, like they vouch that you know three layers of uh, three. I have seen breaks happening because of laser lasers in the attached retina. Yes, yeah. and with gas, true. very bad redetachments. So. See, there is nothing like creating artificial aura yeah. doing additional laser. In fact, when you add laser, you creating more. You create problems. more contraction. You are worsening the traction, and the risk of having break, let the uh, delayed onset break, True. is much higher in those eyes. So the purpose of laser is retinopexy, and retinopexy only when you are having a around the break, wherever. Break. Suppose you have a suspected lesion, bad vitreous base, irregular vitreous posterior margin. And we are not sure. We have so many breaks. Few are left. Few are non-multiple. Then might as well. Those are isolated cases. Yes, but not as a routine. No, but I would also put a band in such a case. Yes. I would never do it without a band. I think the surgery is finished. But uh, I have one question because I think we missed on that point, which is really what is the choice of tamponade uh, in these patients? Uh, I have between silicon oil and gas. And also, if you have PVR, do you change the concentration of uh, gas or What is the choice, uh, sir? PVR A and B. I use uh, gas only. All retinal detachments. I, depending upon the break, first I used to use S, uh, C three F eight for inferior breaks. Now I've shifted to C two F six in such cases, and S F six for single superior break or two three breaks in the same quadrant or in the in the superior two quadrants. With PVR, if there's only single pucker posterior pucker, then I use I would still want to use C three F eight. But if there is any chance of anterior PVR, then I would put a band and I would shift to oil. That is my uh, uh, protocol for VR surgery for yeah, for retinal detachment. Yeah, pretty much the same. Yeah, basically say most. I but because if even if his PVR is there, but you are ensure that you are clean everything, superior break, still gas will be the option. Multiple break in a multiple quadrant or meridian. What happens then? Because as gas keeps on uh, getting absorbed, bu bubble size becomes smaller. The tamponade then supporting all those all break up become technically difficult. So otherwise, sir, there is one other thing I wanted to ask. So I was reading about it also, and I've done that in a few cases that I've given supine only position after gas. Mm. Because I've stopped making retinotomies, there's no posterior break now, and in a case where all the breaks are only anterior to the equator. And patient is made to lie supine. So first day, 24 hour uh, prone, then supine position. And even in inferior breaks, that has worked well. Yeah, uh, that's what I put as that you know your basics well. Let me put it that way, because phys we, we all need to know physical properties of the material when you deal with this. And exactly that it I would say because inferior if inferior breaks are there and they are near aura somewhere periphery, supine position definitely helps. Because that will have better tamponading effect. The only problem with that is, if you are dealing with a fake eye, iris going to go up and stick to the cornea. If you are dealing with a fake eye, then you are having a you are drying the lens, compromising lens nutrition, so cataract progress rapidly. Early postoperative period because of that drying, you will not be able to so examine the patient well. True. Those are two drawbacks are there. But yes, point well taken. And I think yeah. I appreciate you how you. I mean, that's exactly should be understand physical properties of the material and utilize it optimally. Is uh, sometimes if the zonal is a little too weak, it will push the iris lens up or forward and cause an increase in pressure. Ex and also, if you have a uh, iris flappy, then again so it sticks to the yeah, cornea. So that's the reason why usually. Even if I don't want them to maintain prone position, I don't ask them to maintain a supine position. Yeah. Because I'm not sure about that status, and I don't want to see an increase in pressure, which I'm not sure about, which is because of the mm. expansion of gas, or is it because of this? So I will just give them a different position. Don't have to maintain prone position at all. So suppose superior break, give a head elevated position. That's yeah. fine. Superior break elevated works really well. Then no, uh, no specific positioning will, sti uh, will still work. But for inferior break. Uh, just about concentration, he was talking about. I would prefer to stick to basically non-expansile mixture, yes. irrespective of whatever situation is there. Because what happens, 
you talk about instead of 14% rate I'll use 16% or 17% or 12%. That because the quantity you are injecting in HI, volume is different. So exact uh, expansion, how much it will be, you do not have control on that. Because if I is small, less expansion, if myopic I, the same can be expand much more. So you don't know what will be the final quantity. So might as well ensure that you is inject non-expansile mixture. We, when you close the case, ensure your pressure is okay. Then otherwise those are surprises won't be there like yeah. uh, hypotony so or uh, high pressure. Thank you, Ruchir, and uh, it was a wonderful, much. very nice, clear uh, recording. Thank you, sir. That's very nice. Good video, very good very video. video. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Rajiv uh, Reddy, and uh, he would be dealing with a case of diabetic uh, membrane, a diabetic traction. It looks more like a tabletop. Yep. So. Let's see how he takes it up. Rajiv. Okay, so this is a 50-year-old diabetic who had a tabletop detachment, and uh, if you look at it, there is not much of a, looks like there's a PVD, but uh, you see that I'm not able to get through the uh, membrane below. So actually what we see here is there is a thin membrane which was still stuck in this area of the retina. So I had to make an opening there and then go below the membrane. So the identifying this claim is the most important thing when you're yeah, going. Yeah, Rajiv, I can interrupt you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did you do before you reach this stage? Stage. Before you actually touched your membrane, how so you decided any other steps and before you have like initiate your the dissection? The first thing yet? I did is uh, we had a subhyaloid hemorrhage and if you see this area, you still see some amount of hemorrhage here. So that was what it was, so except this white uh, fibrous tissue which was seen in the center, the rest all was uh, with the blood. I did a peripheral vitrectomy <coughs> and clear most of the blood, but I didn't clear here because this area, I'm sure that there is a vitreous still there mm -hmm. and it is, uh, the blood is stuck there and the retina is thinned out there. If you try to go after it, I might create a break there, so I don't want to go ahead and go after that blood which is stuck there yeah. and try to make an opening and once you clear it, then it becomes easier exactly. for me to get that out. Did you use anti vegf for this case, the looking at the membrane? Uh, uh, no, I, I usually don't use an anti vegf okay. before. Any reason? Not used to it, that's it. No specific he, he reason. He is comfortable enough and confident enough that he'll get <laughs> the age and with his speed that bleeding will not be an issue. In between, maybe for a minute or two, I do that. If there is, if I'm cutting a uh, blood vessel major uh, attachment, I do that. Otherwise, I usually don't uh, uh, increase. And uh, even if I increase, I'll reduce it and see. And if I still feel it's bleeding, I would go ahead and uh, diathermize. And if it's on the attached retina, I would prefer to do a laser to that area rather than putting a diathermy there. Okay. Uh, Pramod, sir, I wanted. I wanted to ask you, uh, what what should be the ideal time after an anti vegf to intervene? Because there's a lot of... Uh, basically, what is shown that after two weeks, any time after two weeks, hmm. reproliferation can occur. So it should be less than that, but all of us, I think, in general, agreement has stick to somewhere between two to five days, no, but it should not be more than 10 days. Because generally, within 24 hours to 48 hours, you see the effect of anti vegf So anything after two days, but generally between five to seven days, that's what it becomes like. And you schedule it accordingly because our operation yeah. theater scheduler is such that it comes around three th four, fourth or fifth day or within a week. But the real world actually is that the patients usually don't understand this concept. So some of them, you know. No, more than the concept, uh, the problem would be because these are uh, diabetic patients, their yeah. control of diabetes yeah. is fluctuating. That's yes. one yes. of the reasons why I would not want to take that chance. I would. Unless I see a, a florid uh, blood vessels there, I w usually would not want to do you it. Can hold on, maybe pause, put on a pause. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. I agree. I agree with that one because that happened even a couple of times with me also. We inject, and by the time you take for a surgery, sugar was sky high. We waited, and then uh, it got took two uh, weeks or three weeks. Or you have some cardiac issue. 
or some other issues and then things get delayed so in fact then you have rebound phenomena you will end up in more problem actually, actually if you delay the whole thing then the contracture start becoming even yeah. worse yeah can become a tractional to rheumatoid and then exactly. will happen yeah, combined of cases, it could yes. become combined more of a problem and if you will see here i would say this is how uh, we make the dosas so you just keep lifting it up and edges and start rolling it in and then you will be able to lift the membrane once you get that plane if you don't get into that plane then you are uh, stuck <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then it starts so to bleed yeah, yeah. so it. so it's it uh, i call it as dosa technique <laughs> <laughs> so what i'm doing here is uh, trying to uh, find a gap between the retina and the membrane and try to cut uh, using the cutter so once i cut it and then uh, uh, if you look at it i'm not going all around at once so going from one area so that if you go all around once then the possibility of having a bleeder in one area and getting stuck and then creating more uh, trouble so try to clear uh, from one side to other so you see that's the, that's the thing which i'm trying to lift up one edge and there is a that is a membrane which is keeping the uh, main membrane stuck to the retina so once you remove that then it easily rolls up so, so that's the thing which you what are the settings you are using here cutter setting cutter i usually use a 5000 cut rate with mm -hmm. uh, 300 suction but uh, basically a suction is food controlled so, so yeah most of the time you don't look at so what do you recommend to the uh, 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 new surgeon i mean the suction 300 uh, see uh, with a flow board if, if you can keep a suction little low would be good if you are close to retina uh, yeah obviously definitely not at 300 because uh, if you are little tensed then you might press little yeah. more you might get into a trouble if you are a beginner but uh, Um, as a retina surgeon you should have a good control on your foot when you are doing a vitrectomy so it should and not your mind yeah. and that's that yeah so basically why i asked that question because here uh, movement is different vitrectomy when we do that's a different here your cutter is using as a scissor yes not as a cutter it so what i prefer now with the experience particularly when having now a 27 or 25 gauge 10000 uh, bvl tip when i want to use, use as a scissor i cut down the rate significantly does not mean 10000 means you use all 10000 i'll use a cut rate is 100 if you remember 20 yeah. gauge we used to that automated scissor so something like that i use it as a scissor so basically using shaving mode reduce cut rate to 100 or so or up to 100 okay and like a scissor blade you push between the membrane so yeah. i push in between and activate push in between act and then you keep on moving further so it literally using as a scissor uh, yeah. rather than having a so have a much better control than uh, like a continue 5000 or 7000 cut rate yeah now what what i usually do is though it's at 5000 cut rate cut rate i don't keep changing because i don't want an assistant to keep changing it yeah. back and forth and all those things so i give a short burst yeah, i agree. engage yeah, the yeah. membrane that's another just way. give a short burst yeah. that's it Yeah. and then you just cut it and then you yeah. reposition again. it and cut reposition is so cut though exactly. the cut rate is 5000 you are not using it for a longer period so it's almost like a uh, scissors I agree I agree in a in a membrane and, like this situation like this when would you like to use a bimanual thing i would prefer a bimanual only if there is a break and the retina is mobile uh otherwise most of the times you'll be able to manage with do, uh, do you do you think scissors. bimanual can prevent breaks in this kind of situation is a preventive if i am not getting a uh, plane yes i would try to do that because sometimes you will not be able to get a break uh, your plane properly use a bimanual use a scissors to get that plane once once you get the plane then again it becomes easier and it's not like uh, i use bimanual doesn't mean that i don't use uh, even when i am using bimanual it's not that continuous whole surgery i finish using bimanual it's only bits and pieces it's it's a mix I of everything yeah No, that's that's I agree with that. With a chandelier, yeah. if it is there, yeah. and then you just force it. In other hand, it can be active or passive. Whenever you want, you lift. Otherwise, it moves forward. Yeah. So if you see here, what I did is I just cleared the blood from the central here. That's another thing which I would highlight whenever you are doing vitrectomy. Try to keep looking at where the 
active bleed is happening and try to clear that if you don't do it that becomes another membrane which we have to uh, remove and then that is not easy to come and then you create a break So this is what I was talking about. I just go engage, just activate. And if suppose I have a suction and cut rate, everything is in same place. I don't have to change to a different settings. I just have to use my foot and to get it done. Actually, it saves my time. That's it. Actually over, actually, over time, we actually use more the foot pedal in controlling the thing as we look at it rather than looking at the console. Yeah, um, console. yeah the, I agree. I agree with it, it's important for you to look at what's happening to the retina and around surrounding areas. Exactly. Even when when I'm lifting up the membrane, what I do is you just look at what's happening to the surrounding tissue, how much it's giving way. Yeah. So if you don't pay attention to that, you, you tend to create a break because you will never know which area of retina is more ischemic and thinned out than the other area. So you cannot use the same pressure and same force in a different areas. Also, I, I Actually, there is no, in true sense, there is no tabletop TRD or there is no something called as broad attachment. Yeah. If you are at the right plane, yeah. they are isolated nails are there and quite some time in the right plane, you just little bit gently lift it up, quite a few of them just they give way, it just comes up. Yeah. The problem only yeah. with if you are wrong plane. Yeah. The, uh, one other condition where you might have difficulty is vasculitis and uh, BRVO. BRVO is a more, yeah. Yeah. That's those, those are the are cases the where you will not get that plane because everything is stuck many times those are the cases again i would prefer to do a bimanual because there it's difficult for you to get into the plane like this whereas diabetics it's easier yeah, and uh, those bru cases membranes are sitting right on ischemic retina yeah. thin ischemic retina totally flat stuck there and quite some time then i landed up doing a Retinectomy, no. Retinectomy. You just can't separate the whole thing, just chew it no, up and uh, once, once you create a break there, then you do retinectomy. Yeah, yeah. Those are the cases where you might go with the bimanual directly. Would you change your magnification setting, sir? Yes. yes. If it's very broad. It, it's. Oh, you mean this? Well, I didn't get no, to I What I meant was, uh, would you change the magnification of the surgery while you're operating just to ensure that that you can see a wider area while operating. It, it's a dynamic thing, sir. I'm doing a membrane yeah. filling. I do with a high magnification. Yeah. And uh, whenever I want to go to the periphery a little, I want sometimes the membrane can extend a little beyond. Yeah. So it, it's you keep <coughs> changing from your um, high mag to low magnification. Which it's a continuous process. Which system are you using? System of... Uh, Visualization. Visualization. Uh, what I usually use is uh, Recite. And and do it with ingenuity. This is basically recorded in ingenuity. So I have I put it even higher magnification. <laughs> so do uh, Dr. Pramod, uh, do you think uh, with the current visualization system, is there a role of uh, contact uh, uh, lens visualization in these kind of? Uh, yes, uh, I mean that's again case to case because contact visualization. In fact, I would say. See, there are other issues are there, but contact visualization always have depth perception is far better. Sharpness, clarity of the image is sharp, much, much better. Yeah, but uh, yes, uh, and because new contact visualization system where you have a also almost give 130 degrees, 150 degrees view, either way is okay. And let me put other way around, contact visualization system easy to sterilize and they are cheaper also, cost wise. Actually, actually, I think this is the biggest issue when the fellows are being trained they actually are exposed to the best of the systems. And the moment they come into their own, when they are in the outside, if they have to have all these things to begin with, probably they'll end up playing EMIs all through their... <laughs> <laughs> no, but then what Rajiv <laughs> said, I, I, that adds on here, because again, in institutional system, when you have a one assistant to uh, you know, give instrument, another assistant to give you holding the lens, the contact lens system, because to have a wide angle system, generally, they are having a, that height is more so you need somebody assistant to holding or supporting it as against when you have this non-contact system they are fixed with the microscope so then you can get away without one assistant it as well depends on your uh, human resource cost yeah. or you're going to <laughs> both ways <laughs> both. <laughs> human resource cost is obviously <laughs> important on private probably you multi, like the same uh, assistant will be in opd with you he comes in ot and he becomes sterilizer fellow also it's quite some time it happens because then depending on turnover you decide subsequently <laughs> so initially yes so but when he leaves then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then we are stuck yeah 
do you use any fluids in case you get a plane crash yeah reflux uh, yeah you, do you use a reflux uh, not I, not much i don't use much of a reflux um la- the last the yeah, day before yesterday discussion was going on uh, quite a few they claim that reflux definitely helps uh Jackson, yeah he was very man uh, vocal in trying to promote this especially with the newer constellation system somehow i also was uh, not very satisfied and was not happy in the sense yes to agitate blood and everything it helped but uh, like cleavage plain to create somehow i was never i tried but uh, was not as satisfied like that it, it works with me never never uh, yes, some of way. some of his videos actually he was showing as if you know it's a walk in the park you know little of it is there so it again depends on the case how many nails are there underneath yeah. I never get that satisfactory answer like for me I mean you see I don't see a reason for you to fi- use a reflex if you can actually find a membrane there you do you high magnification you'll be able to see the membrane why do you need a reflex no that one way of looking at it what we the other way initially when you try to cleavage plane and if you inject it's a hydro dissection sort of thing and fluid you inject and then it stretches so probably you will see those nails much better you have a rather plain to push your cutter in between mm-hmm. but then uh, yeah then you can always give some mm-hmm. but i was never happy i see, so what you said yeah, i yeah. that's what i do i'm more than happy yeah, always yeah, happy yeah, with see that that, that membrane, mm. membrane which I is there and, and that that's what i'm testing how much pressure i can uh, pull i can exert yeah. Yeah. without creating a break then moment to see and and if you see most of the time when i what i'm doing is not just cutting it i'm just moving the membrane here and there yeah. so yeah. that itself will create that plane blunt dissection uh, yeah. sort of a thing yeah. see i ask question about uh, visualization system do you think ingenuity or this head sub surgery adds in uh, uh, view what are the advantages mm-hmm. you yes. or uh, the conventional things non contact or things you is yeah it may be a little better than what we usually get but it's not that it's uh, you, uh, that's so much superior that you will not be able to manage things uh, probably will not change the outcome and yeah. it's not really th- lot you talk about uh, like it will change your ease or something i don't think surgery wise it's exactly same except probably visualization is yeah. better for <laughs> others <laughs> as a surgeon particularly as experienced surgeon won't make my difference for you rather uh, i mean it's uh, i should not say but it laras with we having a ingenuity i also realize in fact it create a problem with the posture now yeah. because <laughs> what happened one thing is uh, you are not looking straight you are looking a little bit one side hmm. that is one thing second thing is when you have eye pieces at a higher level and once we adjusted you back and neck is stretch so that helps you to maintain your position but when you are looking at the screen you are not not having a you are where you need to i pieces during surgery knowing only slowly start slumping down and back start bending down neck start slowly going down and in fact and that happens unknowingly and eventually you land up like a bending your back not keeping it straight head is straight but back start bending it but you are i pieces at particular level, you have to keep on stretching because pieces are the i pieces are fixed at one level so this is uh, yeah i agree with that like uh, posture depends on Sorry, what yeah. you are looking at yes. you are looking at neck that also i am not sure because you cannot keep it right in front of you but you have to pull your that's head exactly to one said, side head also that also will, one side. will create a stress on your neck yeah, so there is yeah. no other thing like agree. you cannot yeah but then yeah, visualization may be a little better than what you would get but in provided there is not much of a blood around so there are down sides to it also so i have i've been so i've been using it for the past 3 years but that doesn't mean that i it's a ad- change my surgical outcomes for many of my patients yeah, I, i didn't see a jump in success rate for me <laughs> <laughs> you find a difference between 25 and 27 gauge in diabetics sir that's a particularly uh 25 is good enough i feel 27 we can but the one of the reason why i don't use is uh, i am a private practitioner cost of accessories actually is 
<laughs> because so. 27 gauge i use i can't use in for the next case yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> when i went to say prior practitioner because i need to look at what i am spending also <laughs> now that's why theoretically talking yes is uh, 27 probably will be better in this scenario what are talking because you get a plane you can go in between the- but yes the but when, when a tough membranes are there again with 27 gauge does bend yeah. and that's oh. the issue oh. and most important what raj is like uh, tomorrow somebody will come with a 30 gauge also <coughs> you need to look at the economics okay so uh, i don't i won't say that you should not adopt technology but at the same time it has to be financially economically viable as well because there is certain amount quantum only you can charge patient somebody has to pay for it okay somebody yeah. has to pay for it just look at it that way i think in the coming years it's actually going to be through these insurance companies and if you look at those rates that are there going down and down sir those are going to make it even worse but definitely 27 gauge technically uh, i mean the, with with the use of 27 gauge cutter the s- this membrane surgery will be comparatively easier the cost is is definitely an issue yeah you know you know yeah, it's a what we initially we thought when we started using 27 we thought okay uh, bad diabetic we use won't use 27 because it may not be good use 23 25 because lot of manipulation in there that was perception so tough cases you use uh, use a 25 or 23 and where you have just only ilm peeling or only this one you use a 27 we realize yeah. no with time in fact these are the eyes 27 is definitely far superior than 23 or 25 the companies so are coming with the combined gauge set also now mm-hmm. you can do core vitrectomy <laughs> and other things with your 23 or 25 and for this they have they are supplying a 27 gauge double cut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to charge double to your patients? Yes. No. They are not going to be understanding whether you're using this uh, you know the system. So it's all most all about would See, you want to increase your loss? Uh, I I can just use a scissors if you want to cut. <coughs> and exactly. Easier. Exactly. So I will forward this a little the only thing is us part and other people also slowly going to understanding economics and they started reusing the instrument mm. Mm. and we talk about That's again single use because our scenario single use is just not viable yet. scientifically talking about theoretically speaking about yes single use is always better because sterilization issues are always there the smaller the gauge smaller the lumen you are never sure about proper sterilization but that issue is always there but eventually end of the day economics you have to compromise somewhere but please don't tell your patient that i am reusing because tomorrow he goes in a court you cannot stand because much company stamps on this only for a single use and if a patient goes something like infection or something you will not be able to defend yourself <laughs> how do you deal with this blood that is uh, collected on the surface i usually keep removing it time to time unless there is an active bleed which is happening i'll not go do diathermy the reason why i have not done diathermy in this is i have not created a break yet and i don't want to create a break thank you and if i do a diathermy that means i'm creating a break 100% once so diathermy it, adds on some inflammation as well yeah and once i do it then it's like uh, you are in for trouble then i have to do by manual most important is this type of surgery is they take time you have to go slow you have need to have patience you can't do these cases in a 15 minutes or 20 minutes i am finishing with ectomy you can't put a 10 cases in a day and finish up everything no it doesn't work these cases take time you want really want to do the good job proper job you have to keep time when dealing with this type of eyes so if you notice here so there is this membrane is going beyond <coughs> little further so i'm yeah. trying to get that plane again but uh, once you remove that it actually membrane easily comes out yes the only thing which we have to make sure is those thin membranes which are keeping that stuck to the retina you just have to get them around so that's why i keep moving the cutter around it sometimes it's like a blunt uh, like using like a brush spatula 
the spatula so just to get that out once it comes out it easily rolls into the cutter you see, you see that, that's the movement which i'm doing i'm just trying to do a blunt movement that actually lifts up the membrane there so this part is where that blood which is collected which would make it difficult so i usually try to go and remove it So what would your counseling be sir for such a patient counseling usually tell them like it, we will do a surgery visual recovery depends on your retinal status nazar aa bhi sakta hai nahi bhi aa sakta re surgery what about the chances of re surgery because this is a particularly bad case re surgery is yeah. usually diabetics most of the times once you remove membranes and do it re surgeries are quite rare so you would put oil or gas in this yeah. case i have put oil one of the reason is uh, in this case i have put oil mainly because uh, the, m- most of my patients come from out station and then they had to fly back but even otherwise i if i have not created a break i usually leave it there i don't we, even put gas we need to make it a little fast now it's almost done yeah no no you can okay. take time hmm. yeah so yeah, yeah, there is no break no oh, tamponade yeah, tampon. no yeah. tamponade that's exactly. exactly what i found and 100% i agree with rajiv because uh, recur- like what you would see in rd and pbr where risk of recurrence is high once you do a good surgery here unlikely retina will detach again provided a recurrent bleed it. that's a totally different problem it yeah. can happen uh, but that you can deal it separately but not once you can do a good job on the table because that's why these eyes are quite that way you are satisfying surgeries how do you remove this the blood which is on the surface of the retina uh i use a fluid at the end a backflush either remove it off sometime what happened the blood you is do so an sticky ep- yeah, yeah. You might not remove yeah. wait so for if it if it's too absorb. sticky you just leave it leave don't, it don't exactly. worry too much about it creating break just uh-huh. leave it over week or two it will liquefy liquefy you may feel patient may not be happy initially early post operative period but most of the time it get absa one is done over a month or six so weeks, yeah. six weeks yes. so here i feel that it's stuck so i went in with the scissors so just to create a plane and just remove that attachments a little and then again go with the cutter again you don't have to actually go with the scissors to cut the complete thing just make that plane like what you're talking about 27 gauge where you can just go easily so use that scissors to do that so just go inside just separate it a little you get that plane and then you can go inside so why not just leave this small piece it's close to um, it's, it's on the arcade bit. that's the reason yeah, why i did not uh, leave it it's a little bigger than what i would have left so that's why i try to minimize it as much as possible i still leave sometimes but not a big ones the so one thing which i am not sure is once you have done uh, see that small thing i usually remove leave it there like that if it comes out fine if not just leave it there that's not going to create too much of a problem but if it's a bigger one uh, sometimes that also will be a reason for the bleed re bleeds so we would not prefer to leave that bigger membranes yeah, as far as possible you want to get out everything but if you are worried about risking and creating iatrogenic brain which you are not created till now i won't mind leaving it that way it's just you have to risk benefit you just way because once your traction is this relieved you don't have bridging traction most important yes. yeah. then probably small stump probably you can leave it and that's yeah. again a problem with a cu- cutter scissor you may be able to shave it off yeah. and remove yeah. but cutter sometimes is risky because you are sucking this and sometimes this is the last moment and everything you have done all effort energy you have put in and suddenly and something comes pa- j- yeah. jumps into port no harm leaving and this is the time probably do not hesitate using scissor also this is probably yeah. one of the indications yeah. small bit is left so that's what i was shape. trying with scissors in between so yeah. and that's an area i don't want to create yeah. break yeah.
That's almost done. Okay, that's it. No, I saw a thinned out small area which was, so I did a diathermy and removed the fluid from there. I didn't want to leave it there and then again feel bad later. Exactly. So, you then finish it with oil in? Yes, for this patient, yes, I put oil. As I said, like the patient was out station, was supposed to go so it. Otherwise, they would have left the gas inside. So I think, uh, can we say that uh, we are ending this talk right now here? Yes. Uh, Rajiv, it was a wonderful walk that we went through. I think a couple of things are coming out very clear. One is, Every time that we are looking at the surgical aspect, we are looking at the economics. Sometimes we are looking at the economics plus the surgical and the safety component added. And the third thing is uh, one needs to be meticulous and not doing half things here and half things elsewhere. And be flexible. And be flexible. <laughs> I think, uh, and then don't need to feel by using oil, you know, like uh, it's an ego issue or gas is an ego issue. Every time, every case, it, that dictates what you're going to plan and what you're going to do. Thank you. Then we have the a very young, uh, budding uh, Dr. Arka Prabha Pradhan. He is the uh, Recently also got the FIACO from the AIOS in Ratna. So we're looking forward to your presentation, Arka. Yeah, good afternoon everyone. Uh, today I will discuss one uh, case of uh, pediatric giant retinal tear. It was a seven-year-old child. The complaint of uh, low vision in both the eyes for last two months, and diagnosed as both eye, uh, both eyes total cataract. And cataract surgery in the left eye was done elsewhere one and a half months back, and uh, they referred here uh, for the retinal detachment management. So there was history of bath asphyxia and ICU admission and delayed developmental milestones. And vision in right eye was, uh, PL was negative, but in left eye, the PL was there, but PR was inaccurate. There was presence of nystagmus, and there was few synechia and sluggishly responsive pupil in both the eyes. And right eye, there was complicated cataract, but left eye, as cataract surgery was done uh, one and a half months back, it was pseudophagic. We did the ultrasound B scan, and in right eye, there was uh, Open funnel retinal detachment with interretinal cyst was present, suggestive of chronic retinal detachment in the right eye. And in left eye, there was uh, total retinal detachment with uh, flap-like structure suggestive of GRT with diffuse choroidal thickening. So as because there was uh, right eye was pre the axial length difference was more than 3 to 4 millimeter and there was cystic space in the retina, suggestive of uh, chronic retinal detachment with uh, PL negative. So we uh, decided not to intervene in the right eye, but considering her, his age and the other status, we uh, su suggested surgery in the left eye. So vitrectomy was planned in the left eye. Now we'll start the video. So just... Uh what he had is you see here is that uh, pigmentation he has sort of this eye was pseudophagic and uh, we also do not need to understand both eyes complicated cataract at a such a young age undergoing cataract surgery then uh, you know something is not right inside and when a cataract surgeon has done surgery uh, he could see the underlying detachment and he decided to just send the patient for, for uh, further management Uh, well, uh, exact duration we do not know. 
but parents yeah he will answer that question what was the duration yeah the uh, parents told the duration for 2 2 to 3 months so but exact duration maybe uh, more than that yeah basically it's again mentally retarded kid we do not know exact duration but what parents suggested uh, that change in his behavior visual behavior in last 2 to 3 months that they were sure which he could move around otherwise started bumping against thing all the thing to so be as him take it as a like 2 to 2 and 1/2 months is probably that is the duration so and also a parent said yeah. after cataract surgery for a while he was better and then again vision deteriorated probably he was evolving the body at that time Yeah, go yeah. Ahead. So we uh, opened the conjunctiva. I mean, 360 degree periotomy was done, uh, but belt buckle we didn't put before. Means if re- retinectomy to be done later, so that to be decided later. But we opened the conjunctiva and muscle tagging was done. And three uh, 23 gauge scleroderma was made, three millimeter from the limbus, and chandelier also was put. then we started doing uh, vitrectomy actually just behind the iol the uh, there was few membranes so fundus view was not there clearly but we did the uh, mean started vitrectomy and cleared just behind the iol and we saw this picture the retina was fully crumpled up and it was just over the disc the full retina was just over the disc and it was grt so we uh, started removing uh, the started removing the membrane from the subretinal pre- uh, s- subretinally it was started first with the count traction and counter traction technique means with two uh, in grasping forceps was used chandelier was on and with one uh, in grasping forceps the membrane was lifted and with other in grasping forcep the retina was holding back actually it was not pulling the retina but only the one in grasping forcep was just holding the membrane and other in grasping forcep was just pulling down the retina back s- gently i just hold on this i have uh, dr murli what are the difficulties generally we face when have a mobile retina now there is no support anywhere holding everything just freely thing so uh, anything else different would have done i don't do pediatric <laughs> not pediatric but any it's normally it's giant here. yeah normally i would still do it you know like much more slowly you know yeah. i don't have that much of a skill to actually remove those things so to stabilize the retina actually i always at the point i keep it nearer to it and then only pull i don't take it other way so just go step by step step by step both while yeah. that's the way rajiv rajiv no uh, usually if it is completely crumpled like this it's not going to be easy it keeps rotating yeah that's why so one of the uh, yeah that's so that's why it's slow slow step by manual step step. is definitely a good idea to do that because that will help you to remove the subretinal membranes and once you make a small uh, opening in the retinal uh, folds and you just put a small bubble of pfcl in the center that would keep the retina a little stable but don't put too much if you put too much then it tends to come out and then go to the subretinal space so but at this stage pfcl is you, you will not, not be able possible to do that that's actually at here the in the situation generally what we routinely talk about pre retinal membrane remove first and then go to subretinal here everything is compulsory so first you remove like a subretinal membrane open some more and then approach uh, within the funnel in fact if you are keeping the instrument the one that you are stabilizing the retina nearer to the point where you are actually feeding, exactly that's what we are doing that is the only way that it can come yeah, that's what counter traction traction yes. counter that's what you are holding yes. the retina with one and other one is and doing it in the same line yeah what was the status of vitreous in this patient vitreous was turbid posterior capsule was uh, like a partly opaque rather than opaque i would say lot of pigment dispersion in a vitreous cavity and in a uh, like a behind the iol 
and we were not sure though we were suspecting gi- giant ear we were not sure what exactly we are dealing with because actually retina we could never see we, there was no view and that's the reason why we decided to open conjunctiva tag muscle keep tunnel ready because it's, if at all we decided at end to add on the encircling band would have been easier rather than having everything inside going on lateral so but decided not to put a band but tunnels were made after clearing vitreous then only we saw this thing how do you avoid the rotation hmm? how do you avoid that the will come to that one go it yeah then uh, there were lots of membranes subretinally it was removing it same way yeah fortunately did not bleed that much luckily so in between cutter one hand and forcep other eye so cutter also did the same thing holding the retina back mm-hmm. and pulling the forcep and two forceps were basically sometime helping us hand in hand one with hold that entire band with one hand pull little bit hold with the other forcep and you release it and then hold it on that pulling like a rope hand hand over hand. what is the choice of forceps in this situation Raka, you want to end grasp? Yeah, end uh, grasp. Yeah, yeah. Started yeah. with end grasping forcep, but when you realize for membranes were tough, Seriously. and sometimes they are slipping up because the the architect design of the forcep is such chances unless you do hold a tip, it slips up. So you have a mass max grip forcep. Serrated. Yeah, serrated max grip, which have jaws are flat and they approximate much better, and that those forces are even much stronger. again 23 gauge is because of partly that partly pay, uh, axial length was very high so that is one more reason why i decided to go at 23 not 25 then there was one uh, presence of na- napkin ring so we have, uh, it was removing with the max grip forcep and in grasping forcep just uh, traction counter traction method that was a ma- ma- this mm. one a napkin right. snap and then uh, it opens yeah. but in this case it doesn't come out as easily as uh, it comes in yeah. fact that is this is the uh, ti- this is the thing took most maximum time separate pre retinal membrane removal it took maximum time during the surgery once is open up um, it was not really that bad uh, in pre retinally So this definitely is a long-standing one. It doesn't yeah. look to be a two-three yeah. month. But exactly. Mm-hmm. We'll go a little bit fast forward. Yeah. So, so yes. uh, after removing all the uh, subretinal membrane, the uh, funnel was opening up. and we used both instrument one uh, instrument as a fulcrum and was removing the uh, subretinal membrane so some more membranes yeah, you can see the amount of pigmentation in this yes but the whole thing was dispersed pigmentation and throughout with this cavity there was uh, bridging like band it was excised this is again one large one mm. you see it's like a like as a, a pre entire retina this is how, how thick it was 360 for degree times yeah for that sometime uh, the both forceps was used and forcep and cutter was also used in between this is probably like a little bit fast forward uh, video like uh, okay and then the funnel was uh, started opening up then we started to remove the pre retinal membrane and the full retina was uh, rolled up so unrolling of edges was started with the forcep and uh, with the cutter the unrolling of the edge, uh, unrolling of the 
retinal edge was, was done now yeah, after this because uh, like wanted little bit more open what rajiv said otherwise at this stage you put it will just roll whole thing one side and pfc will run over and then go so we wanted little bit more this one edges little bit open up and then we put a pfc here it uh, closed funnel was opened up and uh, disc was also visible see so basically the again message here is when the initially the way it was looking uh, too many membranes external uh, like uh, subretinally uh, it was not that bad inside once you open those up this is what yeah then we st uh, started uh, peeling the preretinal membrane because in fact initially in between i tried to put some pfcl here mm -hmm. it rolled out oh. so decided to open up that posterior pole little bit before putting more some more true we'll go a little bit fast yeah this after, is what now after removing uh, the preretinal membrane uh, pfcl was injected again here while injecting what dr murli asked like how to avoid the rotation of the macula mm -hmm. um, so basically inject very gradually ensuring flatten the posterior pole first and with the other instrument holding the retina in a such a way that minimize the rotation as much as possible okay still once in a while if traction is not relieved it still can rotate but if something that happen you have to go back remove those membranes and come back again and then holding pr right. practically on temporal side i was holding the retina while pill putting the pfcl on and once foveal area macular area flatten and pfcl runs beyond arcade then there was no issue i think i think that that was the key when you hold the edge on one side then the chances of rotation is big lesser yeah. and to our surprise actually except that one edge when retina open up it was almost going up to the aura oh. then we injected more pfcl and started uh, laser retinopexy near confluent burn at the uh, margin of the retina 3 to 4 rows of burns was given then uh, pfcl uh, silicon oil exchange was done here we used uh, 1300 cent stock of silicon oil how would you prevent uh, a uh, 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 slippage of flap here yeah we can uh, directly do the pfcl oil exchange for um, uh, first we started uh, with means pfcl is inside the eye so we started uh, Uh, fluid to come out with uh, means inject oil in one port and uh, with the other uh, means with fluid needle or with black flush needle we uh, allow the uh, fluid to come out first and then we go inside uh, with the fluid needle uh, at the pfcl bubble and at the uh, margin of the means retina retinotomy we uh, aspirate the fluid from the uh, margin of the retinotomy and that started injecting oil and pfcl was aspirated out uh, with the fluid needle or black flush needle yeah fine so just move forward yeah. and probably actually this is the end, end of the surgery and only now yeah. just on so the so that last side. bubble was removed now what yeah. was the cho uh, what was your uh, silicon oil uh, well 1300. i use always 1300 mm -hmm. i hardly use ever 5000 now does it because as far as tamponading effect is concerned there is no difference there is no difference and unless pressure goes high this also is not going to emulsify okay and but remove 5000 is a difficult optic nerve uh, pressure sir higher so i think uh, we have come to the end of this session this was post up this was uh, post up day for fundus photo and what was the patient's reaction he is able to walk in the room but it's just one week because right now he just last week surgery oh he just could walk in with the with the parents uh, which he could not but we have to wait now keeping finger crossed true
True. I think Arka, it was very nice, and I think we are concluding the session. Uh, so we had a very interesting uh, one hour of one and a half hours of discussion, and uh, we thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all the audience being here, being a last session of the last day. Special, special thanks to all of you who were there.